come on who's excited this morning about the word of God if you're really ready for the word let me hear you say yeah yeah all right, sound man, if I could just get a little more in the monitors here. I want you right now to go ahead and grab your Bibles or turn your Bibles on, however you like to look at it. Um, I'm only 31, but I was raised by uh, my, my mom and, of course, my great-grandmother as well. She would take me to church, and so I'm used to turning the pages in the Bible, so I like turning the pages. I'm a little bit old school. All right, so here we go. So grab your Bibles. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 14, and while you're turning to Matthew 14, let me just say, I dare not stand up here and not give honor to whom honor is due and I want to thank God for our pastors pastors Jim and Don. come on I want you to give it up like you're thankful for pastors Jim and Don Rayleigh love you sir love you ma'am thank you for this opportunity to stand and complete this assignment this morning I do indeed have a word from the Lord this morning so if you're ready I'm ready all right are you ready look at your neighbor and say I'm ready ready all right, here we go. It says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, it says, Immediately, he being Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. Look at somebody say the other side. While he dismissed the crowds, after dismissing the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Well, into the night he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat was already some distance from the land my lord battered by the waves because the wind was against him jesus came toward them walking on the very sea early in the morning when the disciples saw him walking on the sea they said they were terrified and they said it is a ghost they said they cried out for fear immediately jesus spoke to them have courage it is i do not be afraid lord if if it is you, Peter answered him, command me to come, on, to come to you on the water. He said, come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him, said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. When I read the latter half of this passage, what I see is not only a moment where Jesus brings Peter back to the boat, but in this moment of reading the latter half of the passage, I am, a, I am reminded that there are 11 other men who stayed on the boat. I'm reminded that there are 11 other men who despite the storm and despite the chaos, they rode it out. And the Lord sent me here this morning to preach to you a message entitled, Ride It Out. Look at your neighbor beside you and say, neighbor, ride it out. Lift up your hands and let's pray. Holy Spirit, give us the faith to ride out the storms of life. In Jesus' name, amen. You can take your seats. Look at somebody one more time and say, ride it out. <laughs> Hallelujah. In the New Testament, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the author of each, of each Gospel, they write in such of a way to paint a portrait of Jesus. And by painting a portrait of Jesus, what I simply mean is, is that as you read the words that are pinned on the page, you are able to get a mental picture of Jesus, of who he was and what he was like when he walked this earth as Emmanuel, God with us. As you read the Gospel of Matthew, what you will notice is that Matthew writes with the intention to present Jesus as King of the Jews. This is significant because around the time of Jesus' birth, King Herod sought to kill him. The reason that King Herod sought to kill Jesus is because King Herod, he was the ruler over a specific region. And as the ruler over that region, this region was filled, it was predominantly Jewish. And so the people of Rome, they were often referred to Herod as the king of the Jews. And so this explains why Herod sought so desperately to kill Jesus. This explains why Herod sought so desperately to take Jesus out. Because he was threatened by him. 
I want you to know in this room that the powers of hell are, are threatened by you. I want you to know that the enemy is threatened by you. And whenever the devil is threatened by you, he will do whatever he can in his power to try to take you out. And I hope that just, that just helps somebody understand the attack that you've been under. It's because hell is nervous. Hell is threatened. Hell is threatened by the fact that you've been called by God. Hell is threatened by the fact that you've been chosen by God. Hell is threatened by the fact that you've been called out of darkness and into the marvelous light. If you know you've been chosen by God why don't you give him a shout of praise you've been called you've been called by God you have great potential you might not think that you are much in your own eyes but I want you to I want you to understand something that God can use small people or small things to do big things and God's going to use some people in this room to turn the world upside down and hell is threatened by you and so King Herod he wanted to kill Jesus because he was threatened by him and I love the fact that although this took place in history, Matthew was still intentional. He was still intentional about presenting Jesus as king of the Jews. Uh, stay with me. He was still intentional about presenting Jesus as king. Because I want you to understand something. Jesus is king. Look at somebody around you and say, Jesus is king. And where the king has come, the kingdom has come. So the birth of Jesus and the beginning of Jesus' ministry is the inauguration of the kingdom. It is, as you read throughout the book of Matthew, you will see that his, his birth and his, the beginning of his ministry is the advent of the kingdom. Jesus is a king who came to this earth with a mission. He did not just come to bring the kingdom to the earth, but he came to spread the kingdom throughout the earth. And Jesus understood something, that if he was going to successfully fulfill the, mystery, the mission that he came for, then he needed some help. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus calls 12 men. Matthew and his gospel refers to these 12 men as disciples. The designation of such a name is significant because as you read throughout the gospel of Matthew, what you will notice is that Matthew is intentional about creating a contrast between the crowds and the disciples. Oh, I'm going to preach it here. Matthew is intentional about creating a contrast between the crowds and the disciples. See, when you read the gospel of Matthew, what you will notice is that Matthew writes in such a way to give you an idea and a distinction between Jesus's interaction and his engagement with the crowds and his interaction and his engagement with the disciples see when he creates the distinction he wants you to see that with the crowds Jesus's interaction with, with the crowds was like this the crowds will come to Jesus when they wanted their needs met the crowds will come to Jesus when, when they wanted him to heal their sick, when they wanted him to heal their sick family members or heal their sick, sick friends. The only reason that they would come to Jesus is for Jesus to solve their problems. And they would also come to Jesus and they would sit and listen to Jesus' teaching. Until one day, one disciple, he raised his hand, he says, uh, I'm, 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 I'm teacher uh, Jesus I got a question why is it that when you teach the crowds you teach them in parables but when you speak to us you speak to us openly and plainly and Jesus responds and he says to you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom but to them who are without it is not what Jesus was trying to get him to understand is this is that the deep things of God the secrets of God the mysteries of the kingdom of God are not given to the casual The secret things of God are not given to the casual, they're given to the committed. And so the difference between the crowds and the disciples is that the crowds were only casual. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but you've been asking for more from God. And God says, I'm looking for a greater level of commitment. He says, because I don't give my secrets, my pearls, I don't give them to the casual. God's desire is not for you to have casual interaction with him. In other words, God's relationship should extend beyond a Sunday morning experience. God wants to do life through. The Bible says, the Bible says to walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What am I trying to say? There are some of you, you're trying to break things off of your flesh and you can't break it off until you walk with God. And so God wants to do life with you. Look at somebody and say, God wants to do life with you. He wants to do life with you. And so he does not share the deep things with the casual. He shares the deep things to the committed. And so I love the fact that even though Jesus recognizes that the crowds were only casual, he never stopped being compassionate. He 
still healed their sick. He still raised their dead. He still cleansed the lepers. He still cast out demons. He still taught them. And guess what? Jesus even fed them. Jesus had the biggest fish fry you will ever go to in your life. I bet it was some good fish too. My Lord. They probably had some hot sauce. But anyways. So... Jesus, he fed them. Jesus fed 5,000 plus people. And, and the Bible says this, that he fed them with two fish and five loaves of bread. And ladies and gentlemen, prior to where we pick up in our text, Jesus had just fed the 5,000. And the Bible said they ate until they were satisfied. And I want you to understand something. Immediately after they ate until they were satisfied, after Jesus fed them, the Bible says this. The Bible says that immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a ship and go to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. Watch this. Don't miss the contrast in the text. He gave the crowds a dismissal, but he gave the disciples direction and a destination. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is this, is that when you are a disciple of Jesus, when you are in relationship with God, when you walk with God, when you are committed to God, when you are faithful to God, your life is joined to Jesus. His life is joined to yours and you are faithful to him. Your highest allegiance is to Jesus. I want you to know this morning that when you are in relationship with Jesus, you have benefits. Look at somebody and say, I got benefits. You got benefits, and, 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 and one of the benefits of being in relationship with Jesus is this. One of the benefits is that you have a sense of direction in life. There are some of you in this room, you have been wandering and wandering around in life trying to figure out what, do, what am I supposed to do with my life, and you are wasting time, and the only reason that you're wasting time is because you don't have a sense of direction. And so Jesus' desire is to give you a sense of direction. Look at somebody one more time and shout it from the top of your lungs. I got benefits. <laughs> Woo. Healing is a benefit. Deliverance is a benefit. Breakthrough is a benefit. Increase is a benefit. Why don't you shout one more time for the benefits of heaven? You got access to the Father? Why don't you shout hallelujah because that's a benefit. I want to tell somebody, I just feel this in my spirit, and I'm going to go here. I want you to know in this room that you never again have to fight to get into the presence of God. Because the Bible says that the blood of Jesus has already torn, he's already torn the veil by his body. And the blood of Jesus has already consecrated to holy place. And so the next time you come into the house of God, I want you to remember that it is a benefit, it is a privilege for you to get into the presence of God. Why don't you give God a praise right now that you got access to his presence? And so they have a benefit. But what I love about this moment too, ooh, I'm getting excited because I've been, I've been ready to preach. I don't think I've preached in a while. Um, and so, yeah, so y'all gonna get it all this morning. And so the, the disciples were made to get into a boat. And if you look up this word made in the Greek, the implication here, here's what the implication is, is that when Jesus made them get into a boat, he did it with a sense of urgency. Are you sensitive enough to the voice of God? Are you sensitive enough to the leading of God? Are you, are you able to discern when God puts a sense of urgency in your spirit that he's ready to move on to the other side? In other words, are you sensitive enough to know when God is ready to move to the next level? Because I want you to understand something in this room, that your relationship with God and your walk with God was never meant to be one-sided. It was never meant to remain on one level. You should always be going from glory to glory. And you should always be going from faith to faith. You should always be going from one level to the next. And he is ready to move on. There are some of you, God's ready to go to the next level in your parenting. God is ready to go to the next level in your career. God is ready to go to the next level in your marriage. There are some of you in here, you have ministry, and God is ready to go to the next level. Can you discern when he's ready to go to the other side? And the Bible says that he made them with a sense of urgency get into the ship. And what I love is at this point in the text, the Bible says that after he makes the disciples get into a ship, after he, he, he puts them in the ship and gives them direction and gives them a destination, the Bible says that Jesus goes by himself up into a mountain to be alone with God. He dismissed the crowd to be alone with God. See, in your walk with God, you have to know when it's time to dismiss the crowd. 
You have to know when it's time to dismiss the crowd, when it's time to dismiss the craziness and the chaos. You have to know when it's time for you to disconnect and unplug. You have to know when it's time to turn the phone off, to get off of Facebook and get your face in the book. You have to know when it's time to dismiss the crowd. And he dismisses the crowd and he goes and he gets alone with God. Whew, there's nothing like alone time with God. And in the text, although we are not privy to what Jesus' alone time looked like with God, we are not privy to the content of his alone time with God. I dare to believe that there were three things that Jesus possibly did in that alone time with God that we could possibly benefit from. Number one, I believe that when Jesus got alone with God, he gave thanks because he just experienced a successful moment in ministry and what way to, to celebrate a success in your life than to get along with God and begin to thank him and I want you to understand something there's always something for you to thank God for you can thank you can think of something to thank God for you can thank God that he kept your mind you can thank God that you got in the car accident but you still survived you can take a moment and thank God that you might have lost your house but God still provided anyways you can take a moment there's always something to thank God for I want you to take a moment and think about something and the more you think the more thankful you become think about something right now and begin to thank God Hallelujah. There's always something to thank God for. I, would be, I believe that we would complain a lot less if we became a lot more thankful. Lord, thank you for my children. Lord, thank you for my marriage. Lord, thank you for this job. Lord, thank you for this house. Lord, thank you for my finances. Lord, thank you for this nation. Lord, thank you for our president. Lord, thank you for our governors. Lord, thank you for our senators. Because I want you to understand something. That God always wants you to be thankful. You may not agree, but be thankful. Whew. I want you to look at yourself right now. Do you see it? Do you see, you see your arms moving? Now take a moment and thank God for breath in your lungs. He was thankful. I am thankful. Life, listen, life doesn't have to be perfect in order for you to be thankful. Your circumstances don't have to be perfect in order for you to be thankful. God, our nation is crazy, but I thank you that there's roof over my head. There's, 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 there's clothes on my back. There's shoes on my feet. There's food on my table. Thank you. Until you work it out for my good. Thank you. Somebody shout one more time. Thank you. Woo. Thank you for loving me when I didn't love myself. Thank you for not giving up on me when I wanted to give up on myself. Thank you for not letting me overdose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I could have lost my mind, but thank you. I had the pills on the table, but thank you. I'm still here. And I believe this was a moment where Jesus gave thanks. I believe this was a moment, and this is a moment for us when we get along with God. One of the things that we can do when we dismiss the crowd is that we're able to detox from the craziness. We're able to detox from other people's problems. What am I trying to say to you this morning? There are some of you in this room. I want you to know that it's okay for you to care and be concerned, but it's not okay for you to carry. You were never meant to carry other people's problems. The Bible says, cast your burdens upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will not suffer the righteous to be moved. And so when you go into prayer, you give all of your burdens and other people's problems as you give those concerns to him. You offer them up to him. Now, this is not the only opportunity for you to, to, to be able to detox from other people's problems. But it's also the place, Pastor Liz, where you can detox from other people's praises. Because if we're not careful, we will allow ourselves to become intoxicated upon the praises of people. And if we're not careful, we'll allow ourselves to become arrogant and prideful and think that we were the ones that made the miracle happen. Jesus even understood this reality. How do I know? Because if you read John's version of this story, what you'll find is that the Bible says that Jesus realized that they would try to come and take him and make him king by force. And the Bible said that he withdrew himself. Why? Because Jesus understood something. Jesus understands that you should never allow people to promote you to a place that they can't keep you. 
the Bible says that promotion comes from the Lord. Is there anybody in this room who says, you know what? If my neighbor don't want it, Lord, I'll take the promotion because promotion comes from the Lord. Why don't you give him praise for promotion? And in your quiet time, your alone time with God, it is also where you can find clarity on your next move. I was in prayer and the Lord told me, he said, I want you to tell somebody in the room that there are some of you in this room, you have been too busy for God. That's why you cannot find the clarity that you're looking for. The Lord says that if you just take a moment and you get still and you get along with me, he said, I promise you I can work this thing out better than you can on your own. And so Jesus is up in a mountain. He's alone with God. He's thanking God. He's detoxing. He's finding clarity. He's worshiping the Lord. He is alone with God. And while he's up in the mountain alone with God, his disciples are on a boat out at sea in the midst of a storm. His disciples are where he told them to go. His disciples are where he told them to be, and they are going where he told them to go, and yet they're in a storm. The Bible says that the waves battered against the, the ship. The Bible says that the waves battered against the boat, and it says that the wind was against them. They're right where Jesus wants them to be in the boat, and they're going where Jesus told them to go, and now they are facing opposition. What do you do? When you're right where God wants you to be, you're doing what he told you to do. You're going in the direction that he told you to go, and now you're facing opposition. He told you to fill out the application to go back to school, and all of a sudden you're experiencing financial opposition. What do you do? What do you do when you've been praying for your son and praying for your daughter, and all of a sudden you're experiencing opposition? It just seems like they keep going in the wrong direction. What do you do when you know, I know I heard him and I'm obeying what he told me to do and they're experiencing opposition. Here's what I've learned. Anytime you're doing anything significant for God, anytime you are headed somewhere significant for God, there will always be opposition on some level. There will always be opposition on some level because here's what I want you to understand that hell is absolutely petrified and terrified of your arrival because hell knows that the moment that you have arrived, you didn't just show up, but what you have done is that you have taken territory for the kingdom of God. I just heard this in my spirit. I don't know who's been applying for a job and you got denied. The Lord told me to tell you to go back again. And so, in this moment, they're facing opposition, and the Lord spoke to me. He says, there are people in this room and people who are watching, watching online, we have to learn how to discern the nature of the opposition. Ooh. We got to learn to discern, because mo for most of us, the moment that we start experiencing opposition, the, the, here's, what, the, here's what most of us typically do. We start to go, well, I guess this must be a sign from God that it's not meant to be. I guess this is God telling me that he changed his mind. He don't really want me to have that house. I've been praying and fasting, putting on my prayer cloth, and I've been in there. I've been tearing for God all night. Maybe he done changed his mind. I guess I move on with my life. Let me tell you something about God. God does not play with your destiny. God does not play with your future. God is not the author of confusion. And I want you to know, God will never give you a command and then contradict himself. So all of my, it must be a sign, people. Let me tell you what you got to trust in. You don't trust in what you see. The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. You have to continue to trust his word when what you see doesn't line up yet with what he said. Shout hallelujah. Look at somebody around you and say, I trust him. 
And so in this particular moment, they are facing opposition. And many of us, we think that the opposition means that we're doing something wrong, but they were doing everything right. They were in the boat and they were headed to the other side. I want you to know in this room that sometimes the opposition that you are experiencing is just a sign that you're headed in the right direction. Why don't you slap somebody high five and say, I'm headed in the right direction. I want you to know that you're going somewhere. I want you to know that God's going to do it bigger than he's ever done it. I want you to know that you're going to see God moving through your life like you've never seen him before. I want you to know that it's bigger than you think. Look at somebody and say, it's bigger than I think. And so, this moment in the text, they're faced with opposition, but I read this part, Pastor Josh, and I got excited. I got excited. Why did I get excited? Because if you read the text, the text says that the boat was some distance from the land. The boat was some distance from, they are facing opposition, but the boat is some distance from the land. What am I telling you? That in the face of opposition, they still managed to cover some ground. In the face of opposition, they still managed to make some progress. You ought to take a moment right now and thank God for the progress. You might not be where you thought you should be right now, but you're not where you came from. Thank God for the progress. Thank him for the progress. See, you should thank God for the small victories in your life. That's what keeps you from getting discouraged in the journey. It's by thanking him for the progress. I started to read this part of the text and I got excited because I realized something. That although the disciples, they're facing opposition, they did not allow the opposition that they were facing to rob them of their determination to get to the other side. There was something inside of them that said, just keep rowing, just keep rowing, just keep rowing. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I came to tell you this morning, just keep rowing. Why don't you look at somebody beside you and say just keep rowing just keep rowing there are some people in this room you can say and testify that you came out on the other side because you kept rowing tears in your eyes but you kept rowing they walked out on you but you kept rowing you lost the car but you kept rowing look at somebody and say keep rowing keep rowing keep rowing keep rowing row 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 your boat look at somebody and say keep rowing Thought you were going to lose your mind, but you kept rowing. That man walked out on you, but you kept rowing. Kids seemed like they were going crazy, but you kept rowing. Sickness in your body, but you kept rowing. They laid you off on your job, but you kept rowing. You had COVID in your body, but you kept rowing. Cancer hit your body, but you're still rowing. Look at somebody and say, keep rowing, keep rowing, keep rowing, keep rowing. They kept rowing. They kept rowing. Look at somebody and say, keep rowing, keep rowing. Keep making progress. Keep going in the direction that he told you to go. Because there's another side. It's only a matter of time before this thing turns around. It's only a matter of time before this thing begins to shift. It's only a matter of time to when you get to where God wants you to be. Just keep rowing. And so they kept. The next time you experience opposition in your life, and I know it might be uncomfortable, just look at yourself and in the mirror and say, The next time your spouse is going through opposition and you're right there supporting them, you got to remind them. The next time you go to the doctor and before the doctor even comes in to give you a report, just... Hey somebody, one last time and say, keep rowing. They made progress in the midst of opposition. God must be with you. How else would you be sitting here right now? They kept rowing in the face of opposition. And finally, Jesus comes down from the mountain. And the Bible says that he walks on the water. Whew, I'm getting excited. He walks on water because the way that the text reads, the text reads, Jesus walking toward them. Because even when you're in the midst of a storm, Jesus draws near. 
because he promised that I would never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, David takes it a step further. He says the Lord is a very present help in trouble. So you might be in trouble today, but God hasn't left you. You might feel abandoned, but God is still with you. God says that if you're in trouble, I'm in trouble too. We're in trouble. We're going to be in this thing together. But the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. <laughs> trouble does not last always. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, somebody shout at me, joy. I feel the anointing and he comes walking toward them and he says the Bible says that they cry out in fear they are afraid they're like whoa this is a ghost and Jesus does something that I love the Bible says and Jesus speaks because I want you to understand something in this room that not only does Jesus draw near in the midst of the storm, but I'm thankful that he speaks. <laughs> there are some of us in this room we can truly testify. It's because of the voice of God that we got through some of the craziest times in our lives. He speaks. And as Jesus speaks, the Bible says he, he spoke. I want you to know he spoke with the intention to bring them comfort. He says, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And Jesus says, he says, to, he says to the disciples, don't be afraid. And then all of a sudden, one man speaks up. We know this man. What's his name? Peter. Peter, Peter speaks up. And Peter says, Lord. First of all, he calls him Lord. Fair. And then he goes, if. Wait a minute now. Either you're certain or you're not. <laughs> He goes, Lord, if, I want you to understand something. If is not a word of faith. If is not a word of certainty. If is a word of doubt and uncertainty. And so when Peter says, if it is you, Peter is not talking in faith. Peter is talking in doubt. And so I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, in this particular part of the text, why did Peter doubt Jesus? Now, most theologians and scholars and preachers have often interpreted this part of the text as when Jesus walks up, the reason that Peter could not recognize it was Jesus was because Jesus shows up in a different form. He shows up in a way that, that they had not seen before. And that is true. The reality is that sometimes God will show up in ways that you've never seen before because God doesn't like to be predictable. As my spiritual father, Josh Carter, would say, he would say this. My spiritual father would say this. Anything that is predictable loses impact. And so God doesn't like to be predictable. Thank God for my, my spiritual father, Pastor Josh Carter. Anything that is predictable loses its impact. And while that may be one interpretation of this part of the text, I was in prayer and I kept meditating on it. I said, God, it's got to be more. And God says that there's something deeper. Can I go deeper? Isn't that what he would say? Can I go deeper? Can I really go deeper? Watch this. Ladies and gentlemen, this was not the first storm they'd been in. This is what I came to preach to you today. This was not the first storm. The first storm of the disciples and Jesus on a ship, Jesus was asleep at the bottom of the ship. And the disciples, they come and they wake Jesus up and they say, Master, don't you care that we're going to die? And Jesus gets up from the bottom of the ship. He comes out and the Bible says he rebukes the wind and he comes to see. Don't miss it. In that particular moment, Jesus displays his power and his authority. So it is, it is possible that the reason that Peter was unable to recognize that it was Jesus is because when we were in the last storm, when we were in the last storm, you stopped it. But in this storm, you've shown up and you haven't stopped it yet. What do you do when you know God has the power and authority to change a situation and he hasn't done it yet? This is what I have to get to you. If you're taking notes, write this down. There is an element of mystery in your faith. There's an element of mystery. What do I mean by an element of mystery? I don't mean spooky. I don't mean, ooh, mystery. Oh. 
No, an element of mystery simply means this. There are just some things that God chooses not to make known to us. There are just some things that God chooses not to explain to us. There are just some questions that God chooses not to answer. And we tell ourselves that I could just have more peace and I could have more comfort if I just had more answers. But I want you to understand something. That's not how faith works. Faith doesn't come from having more answers. Faith is trusting God's unchanging intentions when you don't have all the answers. I'm going to say it again. Faith is trusting God's unchanging intentions when you don't have all the answers. And there are some of you in this room, you're like, man, I, I believe God. I know he has the power. I know he has the authority to heal my body, but he hasn't done, done it yet. Can I help you in this room? You don't allow the experience of what hasn't happened yet to change the reality of God's intentions. It's still his will for your body to be healed. It's still his will for you to be delivered. It's still his will for you to be set free. It's still the will of God. Look at somebody and say, it's still his will what we do sometimes is we allow what we experience to cause us to redefine God's intentions you never do that the word of God is the same yesterday today and forevermore because he's the same yesterday today and forevermore and never allow your experience to change truth and so Peter is uncertain and I'm getting ready to close here He's uncertain about whether this particular moment, if it's Jesus or not. And so what does Peter do, like many of us do at times, is that when we are uncertain and, we, and when we are doubtful, we offer up our own suggestions. He says to Jesus, well, Jesus... If it's you, allow me to walk on the water and come to you. And so in this moment, Peter offers a suggestion that he thinks is going to be the solution to his uncertainty. The Lord gave me this this morning. You have to remember where Jesus came from. Jesus came from the direction that they came from. And the Lord showed me this this morning. He said, so when Peter, although it seemed like a noble thing, for Peter to step out and to step towards Jesus in that direction was Peter actually taking some steps backwards. Because most of the time in our lives, that's what tends to happen. When we're uncertain and we're doubtful, we think that's what's going to soothe the doubt if we just take a couple of steps backwards. And Peter steps out of the boat and he walks on water. He takes a few steps and he starts to sink because he sees the strength of the wind. His eyes begin to focus on the opposition off of what's happening around him. The moment that you take your eyes off Jesus and start putting your eyes on things in the natural and become so focused on those things, you will start to sink. And Peter is not just sinking in water i want you to know that peter is also sinking in his own uncertainty peter is sinking in his own doubt peter is sinking in his own fears and there's some people in this room this morning you're sinking you're sinking you're sinking you're sinking in depression you're sinking in anxiety you're sinking in fear you're sinking in stress you're in over your head there's some people in this room you're sinking you're sinking you're sinking in addiction you're sinking in frustration you're sinking in pain you are sinking you're sinking and peter was sinking but i love what he does he cries out while wow, he's sinking. The Bible says, David says, I cried to the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of all my fears. And there's some people in this room. I want you to know something. The Bible says that Jesus reaches his hand and he catches Peter. And as he catches Peter, the Bible says that he brings Peter back to the boat. But before he does anything else, 
I, I, I want you to know this, that Jesus saves the sinking. Is your marriage sinking? Jesus saves the sinking. Do you have a son or daughter? You feel like it's sinking in sin? Jesus saves the sinking. Are you sinking in debt today? Jesus saves the sinking. Are you sinking in fear? Jesus saves the sinking. There's somebody watching online. The Lord told me in prayer that there was going to be somebody watching online. And you have a ministry. and You've been feeling like your ministry has been sinking. But the Lord told me to tell you today, just cry out because he saves the sinking. I'm almost done here. He brings Peter back to the boat. And he looks at Peter. He says, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, I read this and I got a little bit confused because I'm like, Lord, what do you have against little faith? Didn't you say if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can speak to a mountain and be removed? There's a difference between small faith and little faith. Here's the difference. Mustard seed faith, you have to understand about the mustard seed, is that when you plant it, it grows. Your faith might start small, but it's not meant to stay small. However, in this particular context, when Jesus speaks of little faith, if you looked at it, uh, look up that in the Greek, the implication here is this. Here's how it's translated. Oh, you who trust too little, why did you doubt? Peter, why didn't you trust my intentions? Do you really think I would put you in a boat and send you to the other side to get you in a storm that would destroy you? Peter, don't you trust the fact that I have your best interest? Don't you trust the fact that God wants what's best for you? And he, he brings them into the boat. And I'm closing here. As they get into the boat, it was at that moment when I was reading the text that I was reminded that there were 11 other men who stayed in the boat. The Lord told me to tell you this morning that the faith in the text was not in Peter stepping out. Because Peter didn't step out in faith. Peter stepped out in uncertainty. Jesus did not walk on water to show Peter that he could. Jesus didn't walk up to the boat and go, hey, want to walk on water today? That was Peter's suggestion because of his doubt. When Jesus shows up, Jesus was walking on water as a means to get to the boat, to join them in the boat. That's why you have to stay where he wants you to be because he's coming. Everybody stand to your feet and lift your hands. There were 11 other men who stayed in the boat. The faith in the text was not in Peter stepping out. The faith in the text was in the other disciples writing it out. The Lord told me to tell you that in the face of opposition, write it out. <laughs> Pastor Demetrius, what is writing it out? I'm glad you asked. Writing it out means staying where God put you in the face of the storm. Writing it out is trusting God's intentions in the face of opposition. He wants you to write it out. And the Bible says, here it is, that when they get in the boat, that everybody in the boat, whoo, I feel the anointing right here, they start to worship him, saying, truly, this is the Son of God. After experiencing all that they experienced in the storm, they got a revelation of God that provoked a worship. And with your eyes closed and your hands lifted, I want you to worship God this morning based off your revelation of who he is. Come on, worship. Let your revelation provoke you. Let your revelation provoke your worship. Come on and worship. Yeah, na na na, say na na. Come on, worship. Him. Come on and worship him. Out of your belly, worship him. That means from your innermost being. Come on, worship him. Worship, worship. God, you're mighty. God, you're gracious. God, you're holy. God, you're worthy. We love you. You're faithful. You're good. You're gracious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
We love you. Come on, worship it. Come on, lift it up, lift it up, lift it up, lift it up, lift up your worship. What you know about Jesus, worship him based on that. What you know about Jesus. Come on, do this real quick. If you are in this room right now and you've been in a storm, I want you to get to this altar right now, right now, right now. You've been in a storm. Just come, just come, just come, just come. And we're going to have the prayer team to come up and they're going to pray for you. If you've been in a storm and you want prayer this morning, you've been facing opposition, life has been tough, it's been difficult, it's been hard, get to this altar this morning. Come on. You've been in a storm. You've been in a storm. If you feel like you've been sinking this morning, get to this altar right now. I feel like I've been sinking. You've been sinking in fear, depression, shame, thoughts of guilt. Get to this altar. Get to this altar. A lot of times we like to talk about being betrayed or being the victim. But the Lord says there are some people in this room, you were actually the victimizer and you were actually the betrayer. And the Lord says that you've been sinking in that guilt of your past of what you did and how you harmed people and how you hurt them. And you've been sinking in that guilt and that shame and it's eating you up. Get to this altar right now. He saves the sinking. 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 sinking. You've been sinking in doubt and fear. Some of you, you've been sinking in so much worry. You're worried about family members. And God says, I got you under control. I have them under control because I saved the sinking. And I'm going to do this real quickly. And then I'm going to pray for some people. There are some people in this room. You've been sinking in sin. Sinking in sin. Jesus saves every sinner. Watch this. Jesus saves every repentant sinner. Because I want you to understand something. Repentance is still an essential of the gospel. Watch this. Repentance just simply means to turn from going in your own direction and turning towards Jesus and putting your trust in him. Remember in the text they were going where he wanted them to go. You've been living your life long enough going where you wanted to go and it hasn't been working out for you. And today he wants to save you if you just repent. Turn away from your sin and turn to Jesus. If right now in this room you say, I want to repent of my sin. I want to turn from going in my own direction and I choose to give him my whole life. I'm going to give him everything. I want you to take your hand and put it over your heart right now and we're going to pray this prayer. This is not just a prayer. This is you confessing. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And there are people at this altar right now. You're going to give your life to Jesus for the first time. Put your hand over your heart and pray after me. Say, Lord Jesus, Jesus. say, I acknowledge acknowledge that I am a sinner sinner. and I am in need need of your grace. grace. Say, I recognize recognize that I need the blood blood to appease your wrath. wrath. Say, I recognize recognize that you paid the penalty penalty so I can be in relationship with you. Say, I turn from my sin. I turn from my own direction. I give you everything. And I live for you. Say, I confess that I am saved. Say one more time. Say, I confess that I am saved. Now I want you one more time to say, Holy Spirit, fill me. One more time. Say, Holy Spirit, fill me. In Jesus' name. I want you to give it up for all these people who've just given their lives to Jesus. Now I'm going to ask the prayer team, I want you to just lay, begin to lay hands on people. You can go ahead and do that right now and just pray for people. We're going to walk around and we're going to pray for some people. If you've been dealing with depression, and here's, here's what I'm saying, crippling depression and crippling anxiety, come right here right now. Come right here right now. I'm going to pray for you. Come right here. Come right here. I mean, it's been crippling you. It's almost like some days you can't even get out of the bed. You feel stuck to the bed. Touch him, in Jesus' name. Touch, touch, touch. Go, go, go. Loose him, loose him, loose him, loose him. Go, go, loose him, loose him. In Jesus' 
Jesus' name. Come on, lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost. If you know how to pray in the Holy Ghost, pray, pray, pray. I'm making myself so real to you today God says you'll never forget this moment and the Lord says that in the years to come you'll be able to testify about how real I made myself to you the Lord says that you felt like you were overlooked but God says I have not overlooked you I never forgot you God says I love you with an everlasting love he says you are my daughter you are precious to me he says your life from this day forward will never be the same never the same never the same never the same never the same Come on, lift your hands, never the same, never the same, never the same. Now I command it to break, 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 break. Every stronghold in your life, it comes down now. It comes down. God says, I'm lifting the heaviness off. I'm lifting the heaviness off and I'm bringing great breakthrough. Come on, lift your hands and pray, saints, pray. Pray in the name of Jesus, God, touch, 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 touch in the name of Jesus. God, give him the courage and the strength that he needs. Give him the courage and the strength that he needs to fight it. I pray, God, the same spirit that was on Joshua, God, that you put him on him. In the name of Jesus, touch, 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 touch. God says, I'm lifting the load. I'm breaking every foul thing off of your life today. God says, I'm doing a new thing in your heart. He says, I'm turning your life around. God, glory, glory, glory. There it is, glory. That's what it is. That's the glory of God. That's a glory. Come on, lift your hands. Come on and lift your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Come on, begin to worship the Lord. Begin to worship the Lord. I'm going to do this and, I'm, and I'm, gone. I'm, gone. I'm gone. The Lord spoke to me in prayer. He said, I, I, was in, I was in prayer this morning. I shared with Pastor Christian earlier that I saw God breaking off addictions. And uh, what I saw in prayer was I literally saw needles being dropped at the altar. I saw cigarette packs. I saw lighters being dropped at the altars. And what's interesting is that during worship earlier, I don't know if many of you saw, but there was somebody who came up and they dropped off their needles at the altar. And <laughs> if you've been facing any kind of addiction, the Lord told me specifically as well, he said, he says, I'm going to break addiction off so strongly today. There are some people, you've been addicted to cigarettes. and You've been trying to lay it down. And God says, I'm coming today. I'm going to take that taste right out of your mouth. Come here. Come right here, right here. If you've been dealing with addiction, come here. I'm going to lay hands on you, and it's going to break. It's going to break. Be broken. Be broken. Be broken. Be broken. Be broken. Be break. 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 Off of his life, God changed the taste. Take it out of his mouth, take it out of his heart. In the name of Jesus, let it break, let it break, let it be broken, let it be broken, let it be broken, let it be broken. Bring her here, bring her here. Today is a new day, it's a new day. Fire, fire, let it be broken. Take the taste away. Go in the name of Jesus, go, 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 go. My God, lift your hands and just begin to worship the Lord as the worship team takes us back up. You won't forsake me, no. Come on, as we close. 
grateful for what God's done in this house today. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. People were saved in this house today. Come on, you can do, people were delivered in this house today. Addiction was broken in this house today. So I ask you one more time, Calvary, are you thankful for what God's done in this place today? Come on, amen, amen. Real quick, before you go, I want to bless you. Will you put your hand on your neighbor's shoulder? We got a couple of quick things to cover really quick. If you're our first time guest, we would love to meet you in Guest Central. It's through those doors to your right, my left, in our chapel. Make sure if you're a first time guest, we can welcome you to the family. Next week, Sunday, September 19th, is baby dedication. If you have a little one that you want to dedicate to the Lord, visit calvaryfl.com. You can sign up for that. Uh, also, next Friday night, where are all my men at? Oh, come on, men. The women had an incredible night at GLOW this past Friday night. And men, we're going to get together this Friday night at 7 p.m. to do it. Men, don't miss our men's one night this Friday night at 7 p.m. You can get more information about that at Calvary Online, calvaryfl.com. And then finally, next Sunday night is Revival Sunday. Pastor Rayleigh will be with us in the building on Sunday morning. Everybody love Pastor. Thankful for our pastors in this room. Pastor Kevin Wallace will be with us that night at 6 p.m. We also have baptisms that night. But Calvary, before you go, I want to bless you. I want to bless you and pray for you. So here's what I pray today. I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray that you're blessed in the city and blessed in the field. I pray that you're blessed in your comings and your goings. I pray that your business is blessed, that your finances are blessed, that your family is blessed, and that through the blessing you will be a light to the world around you. In Jesus' name we declare, amen, amen. Calvary, we love you so much. We'll see you next Sunday for Revival Sunday. Pastor Rayleigh in the morning, Pastor Kevin Wallace in the evening. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching the message. I'm sure this spoke to you. Here's what I want you to do. Why don't you subscribe to this YouTube channel? That way, every time there's a new message, you'll get to hear it. Also, many of you have watched this. Some of you watch on a regular basis. Why not take time and so You can give at calvaryfl.com. You can give on your phones, and you can be a part of helping us take this message around the world, the message of hope, the message of Jesus Christ. Can't wait to see you back here real soon.